let's begin by defining the term language. In Chapter 1 of Language, Technology, and Society by Richard Sprout, the author defines language as follows. By language, here we mean not just any communication system, but a communication system that allows the user to create and understand essentially unlimited numbers of messages, which can be as long as the user wants them to be, and which are made up of basic units of meaning, words, or, in more accurate linguistic terminology, morphemes, that themselves number in the tens of thousands of types. Let's drill down into that quote and tease apart the defining characteristics of language. We'll begin with the most basic fact. Language is a communication system. The use of language allows one language user to communicate with another. Next, every language has a large vocabulary of basic elements. In English, we tend to think of these basic elements as words. Here is a set of examples of words in English. Nothing surprising here. We have words that represent objects like apple or banana. We have words that represent groups of objects like bananas. We can have similar such words that represent not just fruits, but people, animals, objects, like child, rock, and zebra. This class of words that represents objects, we will typically refer to with a name, and that name is noun. So these are nouns. Languages also have verbs, words that represent actions. Words like eat, eating, sleep. Descriptive words, adjectives that describe nouns like green, soft, imaginary. In English, we have a small set of words that are called determiners. Words like the, a, and an. Not every language has determiners. And one last set of examples, words like admirably, softly, and very, that are adverbs that describe adjectives or verbs. But if we look more closely, even for English, we can see in these three examples of words from the preceding slide, softly, eating, and bananas. That the word really isn't the most basic unit of meaning, even in English. The word softly can really de be decomposed into soft plus ly, where the combination of the two results in the word softly but the meaning softly can be determined from the two morphemes, soft plus the suffix that turns the concept, the adjective soft into the adverb softly. Eat and eating are very clearly related. We have the verb eat and an inflection of the verb created by adding ing onto the verb, eat plus eating, eat plus ing, eating. Banana plus s, here the plus s is also inflecting the word banana, making it plural, banana plus s. So even though in English we think of words as being the most basic element, in reality, words are composed of morphemes. 
In English, many words have only one morpheme, but as we can see here, that's not always the case. There are other languages that commonly have multiple morphemes per word. Languages like Turkish and Finnish are good examples of this. And there are languages that go even more extreme, polysynthetic languages, for example, those in the Inuit Yupik language family. So let's review. Every language has a large number of basic elements. A morpheme is the most basic meaning-bearing unit of language. Every language has a very large number of morphemes and an even larger number of words, numbering at least in the tens of thousands and in many cases far, far more. Now, let's look at the second defining characteristic of language. Every language has a rich set of ways to combine basic elements into more complex elements. We saw that in the previous slide where we were combining morphemes into words. Soft and lee become softly. So this is going to be the most elementary type of complex unit going from a morpheme more, a set of morphemes to words. But we can go even beyond that. Every language is going to allow complex formation of words into larger structures. So this can be phrases, this can be clauses, this can go all the way up to sentences. And different languages are going to have different rules for how these elements can combine. But every language has some form of combination, has some set of rules that tell us how these basic units, these words, can combine into more complex elements, phrases, clauses, and sentences. Here on this page, we have several different examples. Let's start with something simple, apple. Well, apple could be made a bit more sophisticated by specifying, is it an apple or is it the apple? Now, again, not every language is going to have this distinction, but in English, we do. So we can go from apple to the apple. We can then use an adjective to describe the apple in more detail. The apple becomes the red apple. Finally, we can add an additional set of words to describe things even more. The red apple, that is bruised. That gives us more information about this particular piece of information that we're trying to convey. So there we've got a noun phrase. Let's look at a different type of phrase, without a doubt. Here we have a prepositional phrase. This is something that we have in English. Other languages may have prepositional phrases, postpositional phrases, or neither. But every language is going to have its own way of combining basic elements into more complex elements. Let's expound this example a little bit more. We can say, not just without a doubt, but without a shadow of a doubt. This is getting into some pretty subtle distinctions. What's the difference between the phrase without a doubt and without a shadow of a doubt? Or go even further, what about without a hint of a shadow of a doubt? So we're able to use these basic elements, these words that are themselves formed from morphemes, to combine in sophisticated ways to describe a situation, to convey information, and to do so in a way that allows a great deal of subtlety and sophistication. Let's now look at verbs and see about creating a verb phrase. 
we've got the verb ran. Well, ran could be described in more detail. Ran swiftly. That tells you more information. What about ran swiftly down the uneven path? So this is a verb phrase that's describing an event and is giving us much more detail. And this phrase was formed by combining more elementary units into a more complex structure. This discipline of combining words into larger units and analyzing the rules that govern this behavior is called syntax. And syntax is, a, is one of the prime disciplines within linguistics. Let's go even further and take all of these examples that we just went through and combine them into a full sentence made up of multiple parts. Without even so much as a hint of a shadow of a doubt, I know I saw the red apple that is bruised as I ran swiftly down the uneven path. There's a lot in that sentence, and it's all made by taking words that are our more basic units and combining them into phrases, clauses, and ultimately sentences. There is no predetermined limit on the size of the complex units that we form. So these phrases, these clauses, these sentences, under certain circumstances that are very common, can essentially be unlimited in length. So here's an example of a sentence. You could easily imagine a little kid saying this to their parent as they're walking through a park. The girl looked at the sky and then looked at the first cloud and then looked at the bird flying past the first cloud and then, and you can see that this sentence could keep running on by appending the next event and the next event and the next event and we would get bored, we might lose interest, but this is still a valid sentence even though it gets very long. And there's nothing in English that says you can do this three times or four times or five times, but you can't do this 10 times. Here's another example of a sentence where the length of the sentence is essentially unlimited. That very, 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 very cute little bitty rabbit is so very, very, very adorable. So this sentence is definitely understandable. You understood it, at least I assume you did, and we could have put in 30 more varies and it still would have been an English sentence. What's the difference between the, a sentence with one very, two varies, three varies? I don't know, but you can still say it and people will understand you. So there's no predetermined limit on the size of the complex utterances, the sentences that can be uttered in human language. So let's sum up. We want to define the primary defining characteristics of language. What makes a communication system language and not just some other mode of communication? Well, we begin by stating, again, that language is a communication system. And then we'll get more precise. We've said that language has a large number of basic elements. And those basic elements, the most basic elements, are morphemes, and then morphemes are used to build words. Within language, for every language, there's a rich set of ways to combine these basic elements, these words that are themselves formed from morphemes, into more complex elements, like phrases, clauses, and sentences. And finally, there's no predetermined limit on the number of and size of these complex elements.